Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. All right. How many of you are ready for this? How many of you are truly grateful for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? How many of you are ready for the message of Jesus' second coming, like the song said that we heard just a moment ago? Here's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and the 18th verse of Scripture. The Bible says, dear children, this is the, what does it say? Last hour. We've capitalized that because it's important. Whenever the Bible speaks about the last hour, we're talking about the end times. And again, dear children, that's you and I, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now. Come on, somebody say, even now. He said, even now, many, not few, but many Antichrists have come. In other words, people who instigate uh, wrongdoing, they are not a few, but many under the spirit of the Antichrist. So it says, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. If you'll turn with me a couple of chapters over to the right, in the fourth chapter, the Bible says in 1 John 4 and verse 1, oh my gosh, you look so hungry for God's word, and that's a good thing. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. That means there are some that are not from God, and some uh, wonderful, you know, like His Holy Spirit is from the Father. Because, again, test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You want to know what's happening with all of this deception? It's called the spirit of the Antichrist, everything that is against God and against His Son, Jesus Christ, and against the Word of Almighty God. It's called the Spirit of the Antichrist. And incidentally, I ought to point out that it's closely related to the spirit of Jezebel and the spirit of Leviathan. And you already know what the Bible says about that. And so in verse 4, he says, You, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them. And what good news that is. We need good news, right? Uh, you are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. What an awesome God we serve. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God. Jesus is alive. You might say, Pastor Lucero, well, how do you really know that he's alive? Because I had a pretty good conversation with him this morning. Amen. I can feel him in my heart and in my spirit. Plus, it's just a matter of faith. It's a faith walk. And I love living by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. We ought to be reminded at all times that whenever the Bible says we don't walk by sight, that means we don't go by our emotions. Emotions can be good and they can also be bad. They can be good if you are led by God's Holy Spirit and to put those to work whenever you sympathize or empathize with someone. But emotions can be bad when they are so out of control and I'm so glad that the Spirit of the living God is there for us. Nevertheless, in each case that we've spoken about, in this Bible prophecy series, the signs of the times and of the end of the age, we've been able to understand all of these things and how all of these things are directly connected to certain words in the Bible, such as in the last days or in the final hours or then the end will come. All of those phrases are related to all of the things that we've talked about concerning the signs of the times. And so it is with our subject today, and aren't you glad for that? I chose to entitle this segment of our series, The Strange and Bizarre Increase of Mass Deception and Confusion. I'm not talking about a bizarre, B-A-Z-A-A-R, as in a certain type of a market, that kind of bizarre, but a different kind of something that is bizarre. The word bizarre, B-I-Z-A-R-R-E, is defined as something strikingly out of the ordinary and unconventional. Something that is far-fetched in style or appearance, bizarre. That which is outrageously strange, odd. <laughs> some of the dictionaries that you might have, such as Merriam-Webster's or some of the other dictionaries can even de de define bizarre as kooky. All right. The word bizarre <coughs> can also describe someone's behavior <coughs> as in the bizarre or strange behavior of so-and-so. 
I didn't say sonso. I said the bizarre and strange behavior of so-and-so. Have any of you ever known someone to act or behave in a bizarre way? Husbands, this is not the time for you to look at your wives. Wives, this is not the time for you to look at your husbands. But every last one of us, maybe we've even been there ourselves, especially before knowing Jesus Christ, acting in a very bizarre way or doing things in a bizarre fashion, very strange, unusual. Years ago, I did a wedding for a certain couple. A few years after that, the man came to me and he said, Thanks, Pastor, for allowing me to have 16 wives. I said, Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I never told you that you could have 16 wives. He said, oh, yes, you did. I remember it very clearly, he told me. You told me to marry four richer, four poorer, four better, four worse. That's 16 wives right there. I said, that's not what I meant, and that's not what it says. I said that because that's pretty bizarre. Wouldn't you say so? A cake decorator was asked to write a scripture on a wedding cake. Oh, how sweet that is. And so this cake decorator was asked to write that scripture, 1 John, or the first epistle of John, 4 and verse 18, which says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. What a wonderful scripture to put on a wedding cake, right? Well, the cake decorator misread the verse. And when the cake arrived at the wedding reception, it was discovered that instead of quoting 1 John 4 and verse 18, she uh, quoted the gospel of John 4 and 18. Anybody know what John 4 18 says? It says, You have had five husbands... And the man that you have now is not your husband. So you got to be careful between 1 John 4.18 and uh, the gospel of John 4.18. Well, I suppose that that too could be categorized as something that is bizarre. The point is there sure has been an awful lot of bizarre happenings in the last few years. And it seems to get more and more bizarre as time goes by. I believe that too is a part of the end times. We can all agree that there are an awful lot of bizarre things that took place just in the last year alone. The last year, the whole last year. And then of course even in the first few days of this year. That may not sound like a good sign, but I believe that that too is a sign of the times. I want every one of you to know that no matter what happens in the next few days, the next few weeks, the next few months, or even in the next few years, even though you may see bizarre happenings around your life or in this nation and in different parts of the world, there's nothing bizarre about God. He said, I love you so very much. So he hung on the cross. Jesus did. He stretched his arms wide open and he said, this is how much I love you. Nothing bizarre about that. There's nothing bizarre about the fact that we are the bride of Christ and He is the groom and we are married unto Him the moment you gave Him your life. Listen to this. When coronavirus affected the whole world in the year of 2020, our local, regional, and federal authorities made some decisions regarding social distancing and quarantine and things like that. Some of their decisions were fair and understandable, while some of the decisions, maybe even we can say many, were considered by you or many others as bizarre decisions. Why would you do this? In some states, people weren't allowed to go to church and worship God. And even right now as I speak, that's still happening in some states. Thank God you and I can have church. But the point that I want to get across is this. And watch how bizarre it is. Some of these authorities said you cannot go to church and worship God, but people can go to the strip clubs and to the gambling casinos if you want to because that's considered essential. Am I right? People weren't allowed to go to church and worship God, but people are allowed to go to the liquor store if they wanted to because they categorized that as being essential. That's pretty bizarre. Their decisions were... You, you're not allowed to go to church and worship God, but pregnant women could go get an abortion over at the local Planned Parenthood if they want to do so because that's considered to be essential. I want you to know that you are essential. The body of Christ is essential. There's no such thing as non-essential people. You are essential. You are valuable. People weren't allowed to go to church and worship God. But people were allowed to have riots in the streets because some of our liberal politicians and liberal leaders said it is their constitutional right to do so. And I say, that sounds pretty bizarre. Forgive me if I get a little bit excited about this. I I said to myself, I, I I just want to preach the message, you know, but I get excited about this because we're dealing with eternal matters. We're dealing with spiritual things. Somebody ought to say amen. Some years ago, and you may be shocked with this, 
an American artist by the name of Andres Serrano, created a so-called artistic photograph depicting a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross in a bottle of urine of which he said that was his. That is extremely bizarre. Even more so, it's blasphemous. You want to hear something even more bizarre than that? A certain liberal legislator, a politician, gave thousands of your tax money to the National Endowment for the Arts, which is a United States government agency to produce and to display this so-called work of art, which I say is demonic and blasphemous. A legislator, that's the reason why it's so important to vote for the right people. Don't just vote for somebody that you voted for since you were just a young person. In other words, our tax dollars paid for that and as Christians we are deeply offended by that and that's the reason why as Christians we take a stand spiritually. We take a stand even with the authority that we've been given and the rights in our nation. That's bizarre what they just did. By the way, as we continue with this subject next week, an increase of mass deception and confusion, we're going to be talking about the areas of nations and governments that are being deceived by the spirit of the Antichrist and even the many Antichrists that the Bible said are going to be here. So what I said is put it bizarre, right? Would you like to hear something even more bizarre than that? How can that be? Listen to this. This so-called same work of art was the winner of the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Arts. It was the winner, and it won the award at the uh, Southeastern Center for Contemporary Arts. It won an award in the visual arts competition sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts. That's bizarre. Strange. There's something even more strange than that, really. Even though this display stirred up some controversy throughout the nation where many denounced it as blasphemous, and it is, the artist said himself, I had no idea it would get the attention that it did since I meant neither blasphemy nor offense by it. You see, I've been a Catholic all my life and I am a follower of Jesus Christ, quote unquote. And I say, that's pretty bizarre. Very strange. I won't give the title of the so-called work of art. I won't do it here. But if you would like proof of what I'm talking about so that you don't think that I'm making this up, those of you listening to this online, you can check this out. You can call me. You can see me after church. I'll give you the title of this. And you can look it up in any reputable uh, encyclopedia to see the full story of this. Pretty bizarre, along with many, many other things. The, the Bible, you might even be asking, well, how, how does all of this tie in with Bible prophecy and the signs of the times? Here's where I would like for you to turn with me into the Gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter. A wonderful chapter in God's Word. And we're learning, we're growing, we're being matured, we're being fed. We're being prepared for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, even if the Lord does not come for a while longer, we know that He could come even today. But your life is not promised for tomorrow. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 13, verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they asked him privately, tell us, when will all these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? And Jesus said to them, this goes hand in hand with Matthew chapter 24, by the way, right? So Jesus said to them, watch the first thing that he says here, watch out, in other words, be on your guard. Be on your highest guard. Watch out that no one deceives you. In other words, that's a part of the signs of the times as he's answering the question of his disciples. He said, watch out that no one deceives you. And take note of that word. He said, many will come in my name, claiming I am he and will deceive many. Well, the key verse is in that fifth verse of Scripture from the words of Jesus Himself. He said, watch out, please watch out that no one deceives you. Because that too is a part of the signs of the times. So, uh, it's the strange and bizarre increase of mass deception and confusion. As we've seen and read from Scripture, there is such a thing as deceptions in the last hour and the deceptions of the last hour. I'm going to say that again. There is such a thing as the deceptions in the last hour and the deceptions of the last hour. And you and I have got to take heed to the words of Jesus. Watch out that no one deceives you. And when we say watch out that no one deceives you, that even includes watch out that you do not deceive yourself. Amen. What a word. Not long ago, while mocking the Christian testimony of one of our conservative leaders in the United States of America, a woman by the name of Joy Bay Hart 
said on the view. She said, it's one thing to talk to Jesus. It's another thing when Jesus talks to you. Then she concluded her statement by saying, that's called mental illness if I'm not correct, quote, unquote. That's bizarre. How many of you heard that or you heard of that taking place? No joy, Bayheart, mocking and criticizing the things of God is spiritual illness, it is spiritual deception, and it is spiritual confusion with a wickedly bizarre twisting of what God's Word has said to you and I. People try to twist the Word of God, but God's Word cannot be twisted. It is straightforward. It is perfect in every way. So that is extremely bizarre under the instigations of the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of Jezebel, and the spirit of Leviathan. Amen. The spirit of Jezebel, what a manipulating spirit. What a deceiving, manipulating spirit. The spirit of the Levine, what a twisted thing. When God brings forth truth, you know that there's going to be a demonic spirit of Leviathan that will try to take that, twist it around, and then feed it into the lives of people that are vulnerable. And that's the reason why we can't be vulnerable. We've got to take heed to the Word of God. We've got to study God's Word. So this is the same spirit of the Antichrist. Are you with me? That instigates the distorted view... <coughs> that our founding fathers of this great nation of ours, the forefathers of America, they uh, depicted them as being greedy, self-serving, imperialists. <coughs> the truth is, is that most of our founding fathers, most of them were men who loved God, Christians who followed Jesus Christ, men who knew how to pray and ask for God's guidance in leading the affairs of this nation. My prayer is that, oh God, take us back to such a time whereby we lean upon you and receive from you and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. Then you will hear from heaven and you will forgive our sins and you will heal our land. Lord, heal our land. Somebody ought to shout it again. Heal our land. And that's what it is. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and ask the forgiveness, only then will I forgive them and heal their land. Somebody say this after me. Lord, heal our land. We need healing. Come on, say, we need healing. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is why we should stand in the spirit, especially, against the liberal media and the liberal entertainment industry. Those who are trying to portray anyone who has faith in Christ as a mental lunatic. Amen. So, again, there are deceptions in the last hour. There are definitely deceptions of the last hour. When will this take place? We've been in it for quite some time now, and it's intensifying. <clears throat> there was a time when prayer <clears throat> was a part of our educational system in public schools. But then the Bible was kicked out of the American public schools and became accepted by the former Soviet Union and most of its schools. I know this personally as a fact because I was there on October the 1st of 1992, just a few months after socialism and communism came to a destruction in the former Soviet Union, including Russia. In other words, after a time when we allowed prayer in our public school, a lot of people stopped it because a lot of good people did nothing about it. But then, of course, when socialism and communism was destroyed in the former social, uh, Soviet Union, they picked it up and we were able to, myself along with one of the other brothers, to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in their public schools and I'll never forget that. But you see what's happening in these last days. Deceptions in the last hour, deceptions of the last hour. Here's a sad story. A teacher went into her classroom a few minutes before class was supposed to begin, she caught a bunch of boys huddling down on their knees in the corner of a room. She demanded of them what they were doing. One of the boys said to the teacher, we're just tossing the dice and we're gambling, that's all. She says, oh, then that's all right. I was afraid you were praying. Sad, but it's a true story. The deceptions in the last hour, the deceptions of the last hour. Are you with me? Now, you see, there's always an application so that you and I do not fall into the deceptions in the last hour or of the last hour. My friend, this is not a time to play footsie with the world. This is not a time to go back into the system of this world, whatever you've been delivered from. But it's a time to say, God, help me to keep my eyes on you and to be straight and steadfast like a warrior who is focused on his mission. Hmm. Deceptions. Well, not only is this segment of our series prophetic in nature, it is a message that is ministry-minded. It's what I call ministry to the soul. 
Whenever I hear about this, I don't want just head knowledge about it and about what's going to happen and what the signs of the times are. I want to see how it's applying to my life. I am so excited about this. Amen. How about you? Are you excited about it? Whew. I'm excited. Amen. I'm really excited. All right. Here it is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, <clears throat> come on now, say, this is for me. Everybody say, this is for me. He said, we ask you, brothers, <clears throat> not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Now the Bible talks about the day of the Lord in a number of places in Scripture. And it's a general period of time that begins with the rapture of the church whereby the body of Christ is taken up. So it's not just one day as we know it, but the day of the Lord speaks about a period of time right after the rapture of the church to include that sudden great catching away of the body of Christ. So it will include the day of the Lord, what happens for seven years on this earth with great tribulation under the domination and dominion of the Antichrist. Dominion, whoa. The dominion of the Antichrist. What a word. Heavy. You know what I'm talking about there. Dominion. And, uh, and there's going to be great tribulation, the Bible says, such as the world has never seen. And then in heaven, when we're caught up, man, we're going to be celebrating. We're going to have a great, great feast. Ooh, you got my attention. I love feasting. I love to go and eat because that's a feast in itself. I love to eat the good sizzling over the barbecue grill in the warm weather outside with the T-bone steaks and all of those ribs, the pork ribs and the beef ribs, and you can just smell it even from here right now. I just love it when somebody will say, let's go eat some enchiladas and burritos and chimichangas and all of that stuff. That's feasting. But there's going to be a feast in heaven that this world cannot begin to compare with. All right. So uh, that's, that's what it is. All right. The day of the Lord. Verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Now we already heard Jesus said that. Now under the inspiration and the moving of God's Holy Spirit, Paul the Apostle is saying this to the body of Christ. He said, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you I used to tell you these things? Now look at verse 6. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Don't go around until, you know, now if you're left behind after the rapture of the church, then you can say, I wonder who's the Antichrist. Is it this one or that one? Because he's going to be revealed after the rapture of the church. I tell you that for sure. Amen. But right now, he may be around. Only God knows for sure. The spirit of the Antichrist is here, but the Antichrist won't be revealed until after that time. For the secret power, verse 7, the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. There's power just in the word of Jesus. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. There's that word again. In every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. All right. But back up to verse 11. It says, For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. All right. So we've heard the facts, the prophetic facts in God's Word uh, that indicate where we're at in God's timetable of events. Then we talked about ministry to the soul, but I cannot conclude this without understanding the challenge to stand fast. I didn't say stand down. I said stand fast. Amen. Stand fast to that which is right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now look at the 13th verse of Scripture. 
It says, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Truth is a good thing. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, help me with that next word. Say it again. A little louder now. A little louder. Shout it now. He said, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you. In other words, don't get sidetracked with conspiracy theories. Stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word or of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God uh, and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage our hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. What a word of encouragement for you and I. <clears throat> Amen. There is nothing wimpy about God, the Father. There is nothing wimpy about God, the Son, Jesus Christ. And there certainly isn't anything wimpy about God, the Holy Spirit. And there should never be anything wimpy about the children of God. Amen. God has given us His order. He has told us how to do things and how not to do things. He said, stay in order, stand fast, stand firm. Be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. How many of you know that's the promise of God and the plan of God? and the purpose of God in and through our lives. And so this is the first of a couple of segments within a much larger series on the strange and bizarre increase of deception and confusion. Next week on our study, we're going to go through the continuation of an increase of mass deception and confusion in areas over our nation and our government. Man, I'll tell you what, I've ne and I've been around a long time, amen, quite possibly longer than almost any of you with the exception of one or two people, amen, I've been, we've been around a long time, we've seen a lot of strange things, but not like we're seeing even today, right? Will you bow your heads in prayer? <clears throat> in every opportunity that I have, here's the highest priority, and that's to lead people to Jesus Christ. It's going to be great going to heaven, there's nothing better than that, except this one thing, and that's to take others with you. For those of you who are even watching online or on television and you've received this word, then God has encouraged your hearts. Give Him your heart. Give Him your life. You can never go wrong with that. That will be the best decision you will have ever made. In fact, when you do that, you will not regret anything except, why didn't I come sooner? And for those of you who are ready to pray this prayer, it's a prayer of salvation, a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of repentance, asking His forgiveness because we've all sinned. And we've all come short of the glory of God. Say this after me, but you're praying to God, all right? Father in heaven, come on, say it out loud. Father God in heaven, here I am in your presence because of your son Jesus Christ. And in his name, I choose to humble myself now and to ask for your forgiveness. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I've sinned against you. I have sinned against others. I have sinned against myself. And I am so sorry. Jesus, you are the one who died on the cross through your suffering and by the shedding of your blood to forgive me of my sins and to wash them all away because you said in your word you would throw our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. I need this now. Jesus, I receive your forgiveness by faith in you. Now come into my life as my personal Savior and my Lord. I give you my heart now, and I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Everybody here, give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Isn't that what the Bible says? Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For those of you who are watching by means of online abilities or on television, I want you to give us a call. The telephone number is right here at the bottom of your screen because if we can pray with you, that's what we're here for. If we can share God's word with you further, that's what we want to do. And you'll have a whole lot of people that are going to be praying for you as well. Amen and amen.
If you live in the Pueblo area or if you're visiting in this area from out of town, we'd love for you to join us for a time of worship at Abundant Life Church, located at 1001 Constitution Road in the Belmont area of Pueblo. The time of our services are 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings and 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. We at Abundant Life Church believe you'll find a loving group of people here and an exciting atmosphere of fellowship, hope, and encouragement. We look forward to seeing you. Heal Yeah. Mm-hmm.